science guy. Most of Earth's water is stored in the ocean, a driving force for weather and climate. At the ocean's surface, winds drive currents. Multiple forces keep the global ocean conveyor belt, or thermohaline circulation, in perpetual motion. Below the surface, deeper currents are driven by differences in density. Water density is controlled by its temperature and salinity. Add several drops of red food coloring to the beaker of hot water. With the eyedropper, gently add some of this water into the beaker of cold water. Observe that the hot water floats. Warm water is less dense than cold water. Add several drops of blue food coloring to the salt water. With the eyedropper, gently add some salt water into the same beaker of cold water. Salt water, the blue, is denser than fresh water. Observe that there are three distinct layers. So wind and rain make different parts of the ocean have different amounts of salt. There are different saltiness. So over here, we have some very salty water. And here we have some water that's not so salty. Watch what happens when I raise this gate. They're going to mix. Watch. The gate's open and they're up. See, very salty water is heavier. And it pushes some of the not so salty water out of the way. And we get a current. Now, winds also make ocean currents. Ocean currents move huge amounts of ocean water all over the world, all the time. Ocean currents are cool. These ripples are caused by the force of the wind. See that line where the water looks smooth? That's a current line. It's an ocean current, a river of water flowing through water. You can see it. Here we have some colored water and here some salt. Now suppose we dissolve these equal amounts of salt in this water. Which one is going to taste salty? I don't know. Well, let's try it. easy. This one's going to taste saltier because it has the same amount of salt dissolved in less water. Now let's say we were out in the middle of the ocean and the sun is beating down. <sighs> What's going to happen? Well, some of the seawater is going to evaporate into the air and the salt is going to stay there. It's just like having the same amount of salt dissolved in less water. Now the more salt in the water, the heavier it is. So it sinks. See? Now the currents set up by warm and salty water sinking and rising in the ocean are called thermohaline currents. Now thermo, that means heat. Haline, that means salt. Thermohaline currents make huge masses of seawater flow in huge currents all over the world. It's salt. It's thermohaline. It's salty. Don't drink that, Bill. Mm. Oh, boy. That is salt. Told you. The sun makes water in the ocean move in ocean currents like this. The sun's rays are the strongest at the equator. So it warms the water most there. The water molecules get going faster and faster, and they move farther and farther apart, so they don't weigh as much. Then the cold water from the north and south poles comes in and pushes the warm water up and out of the way. Take a look. This is the sun, and this is the icy north or south pole. See the water moving in a circle like this? Now. The replacement of cold water by warm water 
leads to air temperature swings and changes in humidity. This alters weather patterns by steering storms and rainfall to new locations. Shifts in rainfall affect plant growth and areas impacted by drought. If there weren't any continents, if the Earth weren't turning, then the ocean would only move in this direction, from the warm equator toward the icy North and South Pole. But the Earth is turning. So as the water leaves the warm equator, it gets pushed to the west. And that makes ocean currents in the northern hemisphere flow mostly in this direction, and ocean currents in the southern hemisphere flow mostly in this direction. Isn't that cool? Well, do you see how it works? It's the Coriolis effect. The Coriolis effect does, however, influence bigger, slower-moving fluids. Global air and ocean currents, for instance, which can end up giving hurricanes their spin. If the Earth didn't rotate on its axis, among the very many and unpleasant things that would be different, one of them would be that winds wouldn't blow either west or east. They'd flow from the poles, which are naturally high-pressure areas, to the equator, where there's low pressure, and back again. But the Coriolis effect deflects these winds to the right in the northern hemisphere, to the left in the southern hemisphere, which creates weather systems that rotate clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counterclockwise in the south. The Coriolis effect working at that scale does affect entire climate patterns. So a gyre is a natural phenomenon. Um, a gyre is simply a rotating current system that's comprised of the Earth's rotation coupled with currents and prevailing winds. So it's essentially like a massive whirlpool, a, a vortex in the oceans. Say a piece of floating plastic from California in the North Pacific gyre can take 10 years to make the rotation from California to Japan and all the way back. So what we have found is that these plastic particles are not just in the North Pacific gyre, they're in all five subtropical gyres, and all these gyres have several garbage patches in them, eight garbage patches total in the five gyres. So that was our inspiration to start the Five Gyres Institute, to look at this plastic pollution issue on a global scale and try and show the world this is an international problem. These plastics are coming from every continent in the world, and solutions have to be on the international level. When I first heard this talk in 2001 from Captain Moore, I heard description of an island of garbage um, that people were calling the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, in the media, it was described as a Texas-sized island. It's really hard to quantify how much plastic is floating in the world's oceans. These garbage patches that exist in the gyres, they're elusive, they, they change shape, they move around. You may trawl for, for 10 hours straight, you'll get a handful of plastic. You put it back in, 10 hours more, and there's nothing. So it's essentially like a plastic soup of all of this disposable waste that we create on land masses from California to, to Asia, Canada, Mexico, enters this North Pacific gyre and gets swept up into this accumulation zone. Islands in the gyres we're discovering are the natural nets for trash at sea. It's impractical to try and scoop out trash out of the ocean. What we can do is wait for it to wash ashore. So to clean a gyre, clean your beach, clean your watershed, clean your street. As close as you can get to the source is a better way we can solve the problem of plastics in the ocean. Listen, I need to get to the East Australian Current, EAC. Oh, dude. You're riding it, dude. Check it out.